A reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 to chapter 4, verse 6. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refused to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is God's word. Good morning, friends. Our text for this morning, which has already been read so beautifully by Val, thank you, is 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 4 to 6. Uh, my aim in today's sermon is to, is to uh, give the summary, um, sort of concluding sermon for our series, but there's an afterword, like every good book. And the afterword will be next week uh, with Dr. Ray Ortland, and I've asked Ray to preach on a theme which I've heard him preach on before. The last time was about 10 years ago, and it was one of my favorite sermons that I've ever heard him preach. So I hope you can be here next week as well uh, to hear the afterword. Let me just read verses four to six in our text. It's on page 965 in a Bible on a chair back near you. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is God's word. Our Father in heaven, the weightiness of, of these verses defies our categories. We don't have categories large enough to hold this. We pray, Father, that you would, by the power of your Holy Spirit, help us into this reality to see and to savor the glory of Christ now, which is the end of of all things. Help us into this ultimate reality. We ask in the name of Christ and for his glory. Amen. We're surrounded by glory. It's never been more obvious than it is today thanks to things like Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, etc so many other online platforms in which, which we fill with tributes to glory. Uh, sunsets, landscapes, weddings, anniversaries, birthday parties, beloved dogs and cats. Um, we're enamored with the glory of things and there are as many different kinds of glory as there are things. We're surrounded by glory. And yet, if I asked 10 people on the streets of Nashville today to define glory for me, I would get 10 different answers. Glory is something we recognize. It's not something that's easy to define. Because glory is that quality, 
of weightiness in a thing or a person that really has to be experienced to be understood. All our descriptions of glory on social media and otherwise are really attempts to help others into their own experience of something that we have found to be glorious. And all of that glory around us in creation, the Bible says, is traceable back to God, which might lead us to believe that the glory of God is simply the sum total of the world's glory piled up so that if you could get all the glory of creation together, you would get the glory of God. But that's not the case, as we see from this verse. God has a glory all his own, and the glory of God is the weightiest reality in the universe. There's nothing quite like it. I can look at a landscape all day long and not be changed, but I cannot look at the glory of Christ without being changed. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. The goal of my sermon is not merely to tell you about the glory of God. My prayer is that we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ and that we're satisfied. Now, if you're just joining us, for the last 14 weeks, we have been describing the gospel, the good news, in three dimensions, past, present, and future. We've been talking about the past accomplishments, the present accomplishments, and the promised future accomplishments of Jesus. But today I want to give the wraparound category for those accomplishments, and I want to answer the question, to what end? What's the point of the gospel? There are three things I want to unpack here, but I want to give them to you as we go. The first is this. The gospel is about more but not less than the accomplishments of Christ. Notice especially verse four, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. For the last 14 weeks, we've been outlining the saving accomplishments of God in the gospel, the incarnation of Christ, the obedient life of Christ, the taking responsibility for the human race, Christ. We've talked about his agony at the cross and in Gethsemane. We've talked about his glorious resurrection and his ascension and his rule of all things and his withness with us in the Holy Spirit and his promise to return and to judge and to renew all things, to wipe away every tear from our eyes. All of these things outline the gospel, the good news. They describe how we were saved, how we're being saved, and how we will be saved. But they do even more than that. Notice that when the Apostle Paul wants to sum up the gospel, he doesn't identify the gospel with a particular accomplishment. He doesn't say, for instance, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the good news of the cross, although that would be true. And no one tells us more about the cross than Paul. But when he wants to sum up the gospel, he identifies it not by its parts, but by its point. The point of the gospel is to show the glory of Christ for our everlasting enjoyment. Notice the word light in verses 4 and 6. From seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. What does light do? Light makes things visible. What does the gospel do? The gospel makes visible the glory of Christ, which we see is the glory of God. And that's why the gospel is about more but not less than the accomplishments of Christ. The accomplishments of Christ in the gospel highlight the glory of God. We understand how this works uh, intuitively. We want, when we want to glorify someone, I don't mean, you know, make them divine. I mean, when we want to point out how amazing someone is, we tend to appeal to their accomplishments or their character or both. We say, for instance, did you see the game yesterday? So-and-so was an absolute beast. He was in beast mode. He 
carried five guys into the end zone. What is that? That's glorying in someone. Or we say, for instance, did you hear the new track from so-and-so? She's on a whole nother level. What is that? That's glorying in the accomplishments of someone. Because we all know intuitively that accomplishments reveal something of the person. This comes out, um, it's very obvious at funerals. You know, as a preacher, one of the things that actually, you know, I don't, I don't want anyone to die. Don't get me wrong here. This is going to sound bad. I'm just realizing as I'm saying this, this is going to make me sound like I'm weird. But that ship might have sailed already, so whatever. Um, I don't mind taking funerals. Weddings sometimes make me very nervous. They're so pressured. Um, here's what I like about funerals. They tend to bring clarity. And I don't just mean, you know, that there's wisdom in the house of mourning, as Solomon says, though there is. I mean that we tend to see the glory of someone's life in the mundane once we've stopped to reflect on their life. And we tend to do that at funerals. You know, you take a man who has been working the same job his whole life, you know, holding the same sort of post in his church his whole life for 60 years or so, and then he dies. From the outside in, his life looked like total monotony. Just the same thing all the time. And yet, at his funeral, his co-workers, his family, his friends, suddenly recognize the glory of his steady plodding in Christ that was stabilizing their lives. And they didn't even know it. And there is no one for whom that is more true than Jesus. Even the apostles who walked the earth with Jesus didn't get clarity on the magnitude of what they had been caught up in until he had died and risen from the dead. All of a sudden, the accomplishments landed on them. And they were, they were amazed. The life's work of Christ makes us say, what a God, what a man. And that's why the gospel is about more than the accomplishments. The accomplishments are an expression of the glory of Christ, revealing the innate and wonderful quality of the person himself. The gospel is the glory of God making its way into human experience. God could have hidden his glory. He didn't have to put it into the visible, historical, knowable, seeable, savorable reality of our existence. But he did. He wants to be known. But of course someone will say, because they said it to Paul, if the gospel is all that, then why isn't everyone enamored with the glory of God? That's a good question. It's a question Paul is answering in verse four. Number two, the gospel is not an acquired taste. It requires a new creation appetite. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. The devil, that leader of rebellious angels whom God cast out, is here called the God of this world. He's not called the God of this world because the world belongs to him. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Christ. He's called the God of this world because he has a unique power in this world. He won that power through his cunning when he succeeded in changing our first parents' minds about the goodness of God. And he's been doing the same thing ever since. Blinding minds in every succeeding generation to the goodness and the glory of God. 
Now, does that mean that he keeps people from hearing the gospel? In some cases, yes. But it's more nuanced than that. You can see that here. Even where the gospel is preached, the devil keeps it from being seen. Notice the second half of verse 4. To keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. What does that mean? The Apostle Paul here is distinguishing between believing and unbelieving hearing of the gospel, or seeing and unseeing hearing of the gospel. I like the way that Jonathan Edwards in the 17th century captured this reality. He says, there is a twofold understanding or knowledge of good that God has made the mind of man capable of. The first, that which is merely speculative and notional. The other is, that which consists in the sense of the heart, as when there is a sense of the beauty or amiableness or sweetness of a thing. Thus, there is a difference between having an opinion that God is holy and gracious and having a sense of the loveliness and beauty of that holiness and grace. There is a difference between having a rational judgment that honey is sweet and having a sense of its sweetness. You see what Edwards is saying. There's a way to know all the facts of the gospel and yet have no real sense of its beauty. Just as there's a way to know all about honey, how it's made, all its varieties, the history of beekeeping, everything. To know all about it except how it tastes. I was talking to a doctor last year about a patient of his who because of COVID uh, seems to have lost taste permanently for certain foods. I objected that I wouldn't mind so much if that happened to me with cilantro. He said it didn't work like that. There are certain foods which she cannot taste anymore and she cannot get her taste back by simply eating a lot of that food. And in much the same way, God is saying to us here that the gospel is not an acquired taste. How then do we come to taste it? I mean, that's the billion dollar question. Notice that phrase there in verse six. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness. Let light shine out of dark. When did God say, let light shine out of darkness? When he created everything from nothing. What's the point? The point is that seeing and savoring the glory of God in the gospel is a miracle of new creation. We can no more acquire a taste for the gospel than a blind man can acquire sight by staring at the sun. God has to intervene. And how does God intervene? Val read it to us earlier in chapter 3 and verse 18. Look back with me. And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. And get this. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Okay, so let me draw these threads together. Here's what this is saying. The gospel, the saving accomplishments of God through Jesus Christ, the gospel reveals the glory of Christ and of God. And as we behold and enjoy the glory of God in the gospel, we're changed by degrees to be glorious as he is glorious. And all of this happens through the power of the Holy Spirit. I like the way John Piper puts it. The Spirit flies in formation behind the Christ-exalting gospel. So here's the gospel. The Spirit flies in formation behind the Christ-exalting gospel. In other words, the Spirit of God only enlivens hearts, only gives taste buds for the glory of God through the gospel that glorifies Christ. Now, if we had it our way, we would be saved by a very complicated and sophisticated and hard-to-reach gospel. Because we like, you know, things that only high achievers can attain to. But that wouldn't be the gospel that glorifies God. It would be the gospel that glorifies us. The gospel that glorifies God is God Almighty, 
coming down to the lowly, coming lower than the lowly, so that everybody who would be saved has to humble themselves. Because that's the gospel that most glorifies God. And it's the gospel that's best for us. What if we weren't saved that way? What if salvation was you and I mustering up some capacity that we don't have right now? We would be damned. This is a comforting gospel because it locates everything into the very capable hands of the gentlest person in the universe. Just as Jesus in John's gospel rubs the mud of his spit on the eyes of a man born blind so that he can see, the Spirit of God takes the simple, humble means of the gospel and he rubs it on our eyes so that we can see the glory of Christ. And that's the only way he saves. Now I know, because we've talked about it, many of us, that there are people here this morning who are thinking, I want to savor the gospel. I want to know its sweetness, but I just don't. Maybe I did once, but I, I don't seem to anymore, or maybe I never did. I don't know if I desire God but I want to. There are three things that I want to say to you, to us. The first one is this. If you really do want to see and savor the glory of Christ, then at the very least, you are near to the kingdom of heaven. A desire for a desire for the glory of God is an invitation from God himself to press in, a desire for a desire. If all you have is a desire for a desire to love and behold Christ, that itself is a desire. Man, go for it. It's an invitation from God. The devil didn't put that in your heart. Jonathan Edwards says somewhere that we always tend to post-date our conversion. And how could it be otherwise, really? We're always just catching up to what God is already doing. So take that desire and run with it and let it drive you to prayer and to searching for God. That's the first thing. The second thing is this, and this has a sub-point because I'm basically Presbyterian. The evidence of spiritual sight is the enjoyment of the glory of God. Perhaps one of the most beautiful examples of what this can look like is in the beginning of John's gospel where John says this, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son full of grace and truth. It's as if John's saying, friends, We've seen something. We've seen something that we can only account for in the category of divine glory. Just to be in his presence is glory washing over you, filling up every crack of insecurity. John's talking about an experience of the presence of Christ. If you're looking to validate your faith in Jesus through some other means than that, say through archeological evidence, then it's not Jesus that you trust in, it's archeology. span Archeology is helpful, might help us trust the Bible, take it more seriously, but the gospel claims to bring us into contact with God himself. Therefore, the only way to validate the claim of the gospel is through an experience of his glory. How could it be otherwise? The evidence of spiritual sight is the enjoyment of the glory of God, not having all your questions answered. 
He's God Almighty. We're never going to stop asking questions. You can have peace in Christ without having all your questions answered. The evidence of spiritual sight is the enjoyment of His glory. But, call this 2.2, seeing and savoring the glory of God looks different in everyone. Um, some of us may think that we don't see and savor the glory of Christ because we're less animated in our response to his glory. Like Englishmen living among Americans. <laughs> For whoever that's relevant. <laughs> wow. Gosh, something amazing just happened. <laughs> That kind of thing has more to do with our personality than our spirituality. I've now lived long enough to see uh, many expressive people who once professed faith in Christ not following Christ anymore. I've also lived long enough to see many, you know, sort of unexpressive people with a sincere faith in Christ live through years and years of trial and suffering and the, you know, the flame of their faith is burning brighter than ever. It just burns beneath the surface. And I've seen very expressive people who were very expressive 20 years ago who are still expressive today. All of the above. The point is this. Be careful of measuring your conversion by the expressiveness of others. The question is, do you have a deep and abiding savor for the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ? And the only way you can know if it's deep is with testing. And the only way you can know if it's abiding is with time. Which leads to the third thing I want to say to all who want to savor the gospel. If you want to savor the gospel, keep consuming the gospel. Right? You can't acquire taste buds by consuming the gospel, but you can't acquire taste buds without consuming more gospel. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. In other words, if you want to hear Christ, but you can't hear Christ, the one thing you cannot do is go away from Christ to get your hearing. You have to, as the Puritans used to say, put yourself in the way of blessing. Go where Christ is speaking and stay there until you can hear him. You come to see and savor the gospel by listening to the gospel, by reading the gospel. God is more eager to save you than you are to be saved. Jesus says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So put yourself in the way of his blessing. Well, that's point number two. The gospel is not an acquired taste. It's a new creation appetite. And God loves to satisfy that appetite. Number three, God is the good in the good news. All right, God loves to satisfy our appetite because he's giving of himself. And he didn't give so much to withhold himself. Notice verse 5. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. I'm greatly indebted to John Piper in his book, uh, God is the Gospel, on this point. It's a magnificent book. The book title tells you what he's going to tell you. God is the Gospel. And um, what that means is that the end point of the Gospel is reality with God. It's enjoying the glory of God. That he's basically answering the question, to what end? Uh, the, the point of the gospel is not just to free us from our sins. The point is what we're free for, to go on enjoying the glory of God. There are all kinds of gospels in the world today that don't lead to that glory. We live in an age of what might be called the improvement gospel, it's the gospel that says, in essence, God exists to help us be the best version of ourselves that we can be. But that gospel never delivers. It can't deliver because 
We're not actually changed into the best version of ourselves by worrying about being the best version of ourselves. And what's the point in being the best version of yourselves if you don't get Jesus Christ? But when we just look to Christ and enjoy Jesus Christ, we cannot help but change. That's how the gospel changes us. The only carrot that the real gospel uses to entice us is Jesus Christ. Knowing, savoring, enjoying, befriending, beholding the real Jesus who is actually in heaven above right now ruling and reigning and here with us in the power of his Holy Spirit. The gospel doesn't promise us healthy kids, financial stability, perfect mental health, and surely not a perfect church. The gospel gives us something much deeper and greater than all those things. The gospel wraps the arms of God around us in Jesus Christ, who stoops to share in our suffering, in our poverty, in our agony, in our death. The gospel is God entering forever into our humanity to show us his true colors. And they're glorious. Therefore, I say with Paul, I'm not here to preach myself. We preach Jesus Christ as Lord to the glory of God the Father. You'll find no better Lord in the long history of humanity. You can imagine no better Lord for eternity future. He's glorious in all his ways. When he walked the earth, he was the lowliest servant who ever lived. He served the poor and the needy. He rebuked the haughty and abusive. He received sinners. He receives them still. The same great love that steeled his resolve to endure the agony of Gethsemane and the shame of the cross is the same love that burns in his heart now for every sinner who will come to him. He's my best friend. And he'll be yours too.